I'm Jenny Gibbs, Executive Director of the IFPDA and the IFPDA Foundation, and this is Print Month. Um, today we have the second of our programs with the Association of Print Scholars, um, today taking us to two studios in South Africa. Before I turn the program over to them, um, just a word, please type your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we will get to the questions at the end of the program. The program is being recorded. It will be available on the IFPDA's YouTube channel um, in the coming weeks. And with that, I'm very happy to turn over all the hard work uh, to Cabell Ahn, who is the Vice President of the Association of Print Scholars. Cabell, it's all yours. Thank you, Jenny. Hi, I'm Cabell, and I'm currently the interim president and the vice president of the Association of Print Scholars. We are a nonprofit organization that encourages in innovative and interdisciplinary approaches to the history of printmaking. We sponsor research grants, workshops, lectures, and maintain an active listserv facilitating dialogue and community among printmakers, printing presses, curators, emerging scholars, collectors, and dealers. We are absolutely delighted to be partnering with IFPDA Print Month again this year. And today's panel is one of our two online programs focusing on printmaking in underrepresented regions. Last week, we hosted a panel exploring Indigenous Australian printmaking. And today, we're still staying in the Southern Hemisphere to focus on printmaking in South Africa through two virtual studio visits and a conversation. Our talk today will be moderated by Rebecca Chantier, one of our program officers for APS. Rebecca received her PhD in History of Art at Brown in 2021, and she has worked at the Cleveland Museum of Art, Yale University Art Gallery, and the Clark in Art Institute. Rebecca is currently a print specialist at New York Public Library, and she'll be introducing um, the participants of our panel today. Thanks, Cabell, for that introduction. And I'm so excited to meet you all and to have you join us today, both to our panelists and to our virtual attendees. I'm joining you from the New York Public Library, which sits on the unceded lands of the Lenape peoples. As we gather today to speak, learn, and share, we honor the Lenape and the other indigenous caretakers of these lands and waters, both their elders of the past, as well as the present and future generations to come. I'm thrilled to announce, um, or to, sorry, to introduce our panelists. We have three today from different settings within South Africa. First, we have Mark Atwood, who completed um, his master training in Tamarind in 1990. He established the artist press at the Bag Factory in 1991, a cooperative artist space in central Johannesburg. The artist press is the first and also the longest running hand lithography workshop in Africa. The studio has worked on editions with 126 artists, most of who are from Southern Africa. In 2002, Atwood relocated the press to what is now an organic food forest near White River in Pumalanga. Over the past 32 years, the studio has printed over 1,070 editions, most of which have been published by the studio. Of these, 90 editions are prints by William Kendrich. Atwood's commitment to hand printing is matched only by his commitment to the environment. The press is totally off the grid and environmental sustainability is the core to how he lives and works. Kim Berman is the executive director of Artist Proof Studio, which she co-founded with the late Nalaka Zaba in 1991. She received her BFA from the University of Witwatersrand and an MFA from the Tufts School of the Museum of Fine Arts program in 1988. And in 2001, was awarded her PhD from the University of Witwatersrand. She came as a full professor in the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture at the University of Johannesburg, where she serves as the program leader for the postgraduate visual arts and art therapy courses of studies. In addition to lecturing and exhibiting in South Africa and internationally, she's an active scholar, contributing to books and journals across the disciplinary spectrum from the arts to education and to conflict resolution. And in 2017, the University of Michigan Press published her monograph, Finding a Voice, sorry, excuse me, Finding Voice, a visual arts approach to engaging social change. Shannon Antonopoulou joined Artist Proof Studio in 2002 as a product developer and special projects coordinator. She received her master's in visual studies from the University of Johannesburg where she subsequently served as the course leader for conceptual studies curriculum. Continuing her work at APS, Shannon revised the education programs to include foundation studies and professional practice training. She was named the 2019-2020 International Fellow of the Peroni Sizer Institute for the Creative Leadership, a program of the Center for Artistry and Scholarship. And in 2021, Shannon was appointed to her current role at APS, the Managing Director of Education Development. 
and also from APS, we have Brene Matibe, who works as the Education and Communications Manager and facilitates the fourth year program internship program at APS. She is a painter and printer and has also spent a semester with the Perone Sizer Institute. Her work focuses and examines both the freedom and constraints of experience by queer women in South Africa. She's also the one who edited our video today and who contributed the narration. So thank you all to our panelists. We are going to start today's program with two short videos, um, after which we'll have a moderated conversation and there will also be time for question and answer at the end. But at any point, um, attendees can put questions in the Q&A function. Oh, our first video, sorry, I should have said, is from uh, Mark's studio, and he's sharing a video by Benelli Coza, an artist, curator, and gallerist, about his time at the press during a recent residency. We are in Bumalanga, in White Treva, and I feel like this place is coming from my heart because um, of how subtle, safe, and still it has been for me the last two weeks that I've been here. I'm doing my artist residency. It's the fifth year that I've been collaborating with the studio um, with Mark Edgewood. And what I like about being here is just how they give me space to be, space um, to show up the way I feel like. What's interesting about this time around, I was coming from almost like an artist blog, I would say, but I think beyond being an artist blog, I think I just, I hadn't had space to be vulnerable. I think doing the gallery work and artistic work, they kind of like, there's a bit of conflict to it. Like my work is very personal. It's very about the baggage. And then it feels like you can't air that out and hold a directorial position because then it's like, well, <laughs> what a mess. Um, and I think for a while I just tried to be so clean and then realized that I don't have to be, I really don't have to be. Um, so this is, it feels like the first time since maybe 2020 where I've been able to just like come back to myself um, and try to create from an honest space. So we're just wrapping up a two week collaboration with Bonelle and what we do is we provide the, the film and the plates and the stones and whatever the artist needs to make a print. We provide all the technical guidance and then we do all the, the technical stuff with rolling out the ink and cranking the press. So the artist really concentrates on doing what they do best. They don't have to worry to learn how to etch a stone and the way the way that we'll work is Bonelli will draw one plate and we would roll it up, see what he's got. And it's it's a very I mean fluid collaborative process. We don't have any prescriptive things of how we've got to do it. And it's really in being awake to what the artist wants, being being present in the moment while you're working with them. Um, trying to get under their skin and understand what they're wanting to do without taking control of the process because i think as a as a printer who's worked with many artists for 30 years it's, it's easy to say like i know what to do with this but actually you don't the artist has their own way of doing things and you might think you know what to do and it's and, and it's learning to step back and allow the artist to feel their way through and come up with something that's uniquely theirs, not not something that's been directed by the printer. We we're very much a, a creative space and not a space that directs what artists need to make. Lithography is really a process that lends itself to people who paint. When when we're trying to to in, to find artists that we want to invite to come and make prints, we we look for people who have have a painted equality in their work. And one of the sort of really difficult things to do in lithography are these delicate touche washes. They, they, you've got to put them on really liquid. You need to not work them ar around when you lay them down. You've got to wait patiently for hours and hours, sometimes overnight for them to dry. 
and 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 if you do fiddle with them, they come out looking kind of dead. And and Vanelli has that ability just to just to lay down these washes and see how they're going to dry. And and I think of all the artists we've worked with over the years, he really he really just has the absolute knack for them. He's he's got a, a sensitivity and a a willingness to let go, to just do what he does, and the prints come out just beautifully because of it. I mean, I really look at some of the things we've made in the last two weeks, and I think, wow, those have got to be the best touche wash prints I've ever worked on. Thank you, Mark and Vanelli, for sharing that beauty, beautiful video with us. Um, we have another quick five-minute video introducing Artist Proof Studio. So stick around, and it'll be followed by a conversation moderated by Rebecca. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Making Center of Excellence based in Johannesburg, South Africa. The organization focuses on all aspects of printmaking, creation, sales, training, and community engagement through partnerships. Artist Proof Studio, we believe in nurturing the next generation of artists. Our studio is a dynamic learning environment where aspiring artists can develop their skills and creativity. Our education program focuses on printmaking. Students learn all kinds of printmaking techniques, including monotype, screen print, and lino cut. They learn drawing techniques using different mediums to develop their ideas on paper. They also learn digital arts where they learn photography and video editing. At the end of each term, students present their work and get critical feedback from their facilitators and peers. Our graduates and collaborating artists co-published prints in the professional print studio. This is where our master printers work side by side to bring incredible print projects to life. Here you witness the intricate process of print making. The co shop experiments and create interesting and new print making techniques to help bring the vision of the artist they collaborate with. Whether you are a painter, a sculptor, or a multimedia artist, every piece that leaves our pro shop is a masterpiece. Our gallery space showcases a diverse range of prints created at Artist Proof Studio. We're not just an art studio. We're also a platform for artists to exhibit their work and connect with a wider audience. We have turned our office spaces into showrooms where people can view our collections. We host in-house exhibitions at the Heritage House, giving our artists a space to exhibit their latest work. We do studio tours, for our visitors, where they get to see the creation and the final products. Create and participate in all the art fairs in the country to celebrate and share the magic of printmaking with the global audience. We are deeply committed to community engagement. Our special projects unit includes print demonstrations at schools, school workshops, kids workshops, public workshops, 
and team building workshops where we share the process of communicating. From education programs that nurture budding talents to a professional print shop that brings visions to life, a gallery that inspires, and our outreach efforts that touches lives. Artist Proof Studio is a community of artists and art lovers. Thank you um, to Mark and Kim and Michelle and uh, Renee and Vanelle for these videos. We posted links to the videos and to the artists, the press's websites in the chat, as well as a link to the Dr. Gianno Mariano Scholarship Fund, um, who is the board chair of APS, who recently passed. Um, so our first question, we're thinking about if our panelists can turn on their cameras, that would be great too. <laughs> Thanks. First question is about the role of print in South Africa um, in the present moment, but also thinking in the past 30 years. In their important book, um, Philippa Hobbs and Elizabeth Rankin, um, titled Printmaking and Transforming in a Transforming South Africa, write about the possibilities and potentialities that printmaking represented in the nascent post-apartheid era. For example, not just print as a democratic medium, but also how printmaking could be recast as um, for redefining and reclaiming identity. Uh, and how, the, you know, so, but for them, the press itself was also a metaphor for this new era, which was born like prints, oppression and resistance. The press also became an analog for the political changes that were undergoing in South Africa during the 1990s where power was transformed from a small minority to a larger democratic, thinking about how the matrix transforms to multiple sheets of paper. And so him and Mark, since both of you started your presses in 1991 and really were involved in this change in South Africa, um, I was wondering what have you seen change with the role of print in the past 30 years and the past 26 years since Rankin, uh, Rankin and um, Hobbes wrote their book? Uh, what have you observed? Um, Mark, do you want to go first? Hello, everybody. Um, I, I I think a lot has changed. I, th I think that's a very wonderful introduction, Rebecca. I think you sum up the history of South Africa and where we're coming from very well. Um, I, I think I think we've moved on from from being so kind of idealistic and hopeful to being a little more. Uh, perhaps a, a little more jaded in our approach. I think um, I think South Africa is facing multiple problems at the moment, and, um, and I think I think that's not something that printmaking is immune to. Um, and I, I think I think too that that the the dialogue has become less political and acute and more global and environmental. And the the we're we're part of that global dialogue now that we weren't before. Yeah, I mean, I I agree. I think when we when Philippa and Liz Rankin wrote that book, I think they're you know coming out of a period where printmaking had a very important role in the anti-apartheid movement. It was very much about resistance. It was about speaking out. It was a political kind of. Um, statement in in many ways the the studios that that formed during apartheid were also like Brock's Drift were also very very much about a political resistance um in the 90s early 90s after Mandela was released in 1990 there was a a period of of absolute euphoria in the country where we were dreaming of a democracy and i think until the first democratic elections in 1994 it was a very, very exciting period in South Africa. When Nintantla, Abba, and myself started Artist Proof Studio, it was, was very um, hopeful and very much about, you know, trying to understand what is democracy, what is building a rainbow nation. And our, our philosophy of the studio was very much around open access, um, free education, the ability of providing a safe space for artists that didn't have access. I mean, most printmaking studios 
you know, required either enrollment at the university or um, in an institution because of the expense. So it was a very elitist kind of activity for many young people. And, and in plant like coming out of, um, you know, the, the founders of the studio were, were um, very much from the Rolks Drift period, which was a missionary printmaking center. And, and felt we all felt very united in wanting a kind of democratic open access space. And that really defined the flavor of who we wanted to be in South Africa. And, and Artist Proof has, has evolved and changed. And I, I think my colleagues can talk to it because we're a very different institution to when we started. But fundamentally, the philosophy of remaining open access um, that focuses on active citizenship, on, on, on principles of Ubuntu, which is a humanity, an African humanity has remained. And so we do prioritize access to young artists who otherwise cannot go and study at university, either for financial, social, or educational reasons. So we are a space that really encourages you know, young people. So in that way, we're still very political. We're still very much about, you know, um, having a, a space for, for, for young artists. But I think Mark is absolutely right in that the, the um, content and the reality of South Africa is very different to those early 90s. And, and we grapple with very different issues. But, but printmaking yeah, has, has kind of, is a fundamental kind of principle of democracy that we hold on to. So that's a more convoluted answer to my... Uh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, um, and thinking about that and thinking about the artists that you were working with 30 years ago, but you're both now involved with, as we saw in your video, with younger students and Mark Benelli, like he doesn't necessarily come from a printmaking practice. And so I was wondering, in, in thinking about the print studio as a collaborative place, can you speak to working with artists and students to help them realize their vision in printmaking when they don't necessarily have a printmaking background? Like how does what how has that changed your practice as someone who helps mediate through print? Has that changed your own ways of doing things in the studio? Well, um, I mean, we, we APS had this this amazing vision of, of up, upliftment and and working with youth and educating people we we very much have always been just a sort of artisanal professional printing space we haven't had that kind of um uh, sort of educational philosophy behind what we do we've been focused on having artists come into the studio and make prints and and i think um I think so. I think I think we're very much kind of um, uh, raw in what we do than what what Artist Proof Studio is. But um, but ha having said that, we we started just down the road from Artist Proof Studio in the bag factory. I mean, we were like half a kilometer apart from each other, and and I was in this the space that that had twenty artist studios. So I was working alongside people like David Kolwani and Duran Sihlali. Um, and Sam Inklingetwa, who's still making prints with us. And so, so there was this, this real kind of energy of, of stuff happening amongst different people of South Africa that, that felt so full of potential that, that, we didn't, that we didn't have from the past. I think, um, Kim, I don't know if you want to pick up on that, or Shannon? Yeah, yeah well, maybe, maybe I can, yeah, Shannon and Renee might, might have a different take so to you'll me. see Renee and I are nodding quite a lot because <laughs> we remember those days. I certainly remember the days when Mark Abbott was down the road. And um, and I have to say, even after I've, I've been at APS for almost two decades and Artist Press is still kind of, I have to say, the pinnacle of the ultimate studio for a lot of us. Um, so in terms of education and changes that we've seen, I would, I would say dramatic shifts in, since COVID. Dramatic shifts. I see young people finding their voice. I think that has a lot to do with social media as well. Uh, this year in particular, just two months ago, we were looking at the work and we were quite profoundly blown away by how many 
young artists in third year had found their voice and they're really engaging with some very critical global issues. And um, that's very exciting to see. So it is a very different context to what it was 30 years ago. But I do see young people with more agency, um, obviously, because the political landscape has changed. There is cynicism, and, and I think it's good to be critical of, of what's happening. So I do think a sense of being jaded. But I did want to come back. I thought I think this is very critically important is to um, really emphasize that the studio that Kim and Fentler started 30 odd years ago fundamentally is the same. I mean, the ethos, the values, they fundamentally the same. So access and giving a larger group of people access who are underserved and underprivileged it's really broadened um, in the last, I would say, five years. Renee has been very um, involved in, in deaf education and bringing deaf artists to Artist Proof Studio. My focus has also been on kind of neurodiversity and kids who are really struggling with that. And the studio is uh, becoming a place where, where people with difficulties can also mainstream, whereas they would have been isolated before. And that happens through art making and printmaking and collaboration. So it's it's very exciting to see the changes, even though maybe uh, the country is struggling. Yeah. Hey, Arne, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, because I know both of you have worked on developing the curriculum over time. I mean, not just with um, greater accessibility, but in terms of professionalization and greater skill set um, uh, growing of what you've added to the curriculum. Yeah, so with me, I mean, I joined Artist Proof, I think 12, 12 years ago. Um, and I have seen the shift in terms of like what the students who come in um, and graduate work with. Um, previously, I think it was more political. And then over the 10 years that I've been there, people, the students have really started working on um, ideas of home um themes like identity sexuality so it's really broadened up in terms of like the past um when when APS started um and then now it's even more like Shannon was saying with social media where now issues are being you know very accessible and where they can also um look at what what like their surroundings and who they are with and who you know they surround themselves with so I think the themes change every year. We see like different, um, even the techniques have evolved, you know, um, where they combining different prints, different techniques in one, um, being very innovative, innovative um, and more experimental. Yeah. Wonderful, thanks. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of, just in terms of when we're looking at um, Mark's video with Benelli, like Benelli is working off an iPad and you weren't doing that when you started in 1991. And then now it's like, people are coming to your studios with all different sorts of ideas of how they want to make this print and how you might have to change what you do or have been doing to help them realize that. Um, and, yeah, before... sorry, Rebecca, I just want to say one thing. I, I think one fundamental thing that I've seen as a change is that people think digitally now. Whereas when we started, people thought in analog terms. They didn't think in terms of digital terms and and it's it's the whole way that one collaborates now is different to how it was 20 some years ago it's um all one has to take all that digital stuff into account in order to make an analog print and it's it's a very different space oh great yeah i can imagine as a non-practitioner um, the next question I wanted to think about, and Renee would touch upon this a bit when she was talking about with the students playing off each other, getting ideas off of one another, um, but that the sense of place seems really integral to both of your operations. I mean, Mark's video, we see just the natural setting and around White River and also, but yet in APS, just being there in Newtown um, in the middle of Johannesburg or just outside. So I was wondering if you could each speak to kind of your sense of duty and sense of place that goes into the operation of both of your studios. Kim, do you want to No, I think Mark, you go first, because I think your your yours is a is a space of a totally idyllic space. It is the most beautiful space 
you could ever go and work there. That's so Mark speaks first. We are in a very different kind of environment. Well, I, th I think I think everybody has pressures, and it's it sort of doesn't really matter where you are. You're still working under the same kinds of deadlines, and um, but we we try and and live in and work in as environmentally sustainable way as possible. Um, we um, and it's and it's and it's a journey that 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 you kind of start and you move along it. So we you know like, um, we've become almost vegan in our meals. Um, artists who come to stay with us, they get served vegan lunches. Um, some of them may not expect it, but it's delicious and I think they enjoy it. Um, we, we've, we've planted an enormous garden that our visiting artists can, can pick from and cook their own meals. Um, we produce 100% of our energy through sustainable means. We have a little micro hydro turbine and solar panels and um, and that's so that's been a whole journey of, of of learning how to work within that and the constraints of doing that. Um, we recycle almost everything, um, including old lifo plates, which I take to a place just just across the valley. That's kind of like a, a scene from a Mad Max movie where you put your plates on a scale and a, a, a sort of a brown envelope will kind of come out of a slot in a, a one way glass, so you never see who's behind it. It's all just kind of um so yeah i mean that's that's kind of the um the, the environment that that we try to work within we we use as little solvents and acids in the studio as we possibly can um we avoid all the harsh solvents but we still do use some solvents lithography is very much a, a process that grease and water don't mix and so we need to be able to work within that um, but I think there's there's room to experiment with people who are who are wanting to to push that further, and 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 I'm sure we might in in the coming years. Great, thank you. So for Artist Proof Studio, I think yes, for thirty two years or so, we've been in the inner city. Very so, Newtown is it's it's a space that's again very accessible. So it's a very urban, gritty environment. It got a little rough during COVID and we we actually had to move. Um, but I think in terms of, of environmental sustainability, artist proofs also have been very aware of um, materials that are affordable, accessible, right from the very beginning, we used to look for alternatives to, to etching by using holograph plates, recycled inks from old printing presses, printing plates, and very innovative and experimental techniques that are, are non-toxic or non um, sort of tried not to use acid. We we went through various stages over the years. Obviously, our professional studio won't had to keep up um, working. We work traditionally in copper etching as well as aluminium plates, recycled aluminium plates with salts, corrosive salts. And, and try and introduce to students all kinds of techniques that they can use that is available and not, not expensive. One of the things that, that I started at the university was paper making. And it was a huge um, poverty alleviation program where we looked at making paper from locally available plants and uh, and developing technologies. And our studio makes its own, some of its own paper, more, more so now, and, and at the university I have a, have a little mill that, that mostly supports its, itself on making handmade paper out of sisal and cotton fiber for, for William Kentridge's drawings. He's a greatest supporter of our little mill. He loves our paper for drawing and for printmaking. So that keeps, keeps our mill going as well as for printmaking. So I think looking at what can we do to to work with what we have is is very important. Um, so I I don't know uh, you know and 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 I've got a very close relationship between the university and the studio because a lot of a lot of our graduates come and and we do joint projects and really try and cross over looking at the resources available in both spaces to our students. 
um, both both Shannon and, and Renee sort of started at, 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 at the University of Johannesburg, but, but really are, are managing a, a very different philosophy at Artist Group Studio, an educational philosophy than a, than a formal institution. So maybe they want to add to stuff about place and materials. Oh, we were just um, <laughs> deciding whether we wanted to add anything, but um, it seems to have moved from location to recycling the conversation. Um, yeah, we, we've started as of two years ago, implementing a program called Vuma Week, which is not actually a week, it's about a month where students need to recycle, upcycle, and think very innovatively about their, their plates and their proof prints and ways of recycling and redesigning new products. So that is a small kind of business initiative that we have um, really kickstarted with the students drive that process. We, if, we, if you have a hundred students and you have five plates minimum of projects a year, that becomes quite a lot of material to work with. So I think there's a lot of potential there. That's really good. That's a lot of plates. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Um, my next question, kind of switching gears though, thinking about sustainability, but now I want to talk about the market, mindful that we are to print month, the fair is going to be at the end of the month. And I was wondering how you would each, both within your own presses, but observers of the larger market, how you would characterize, characterize the print market within the larger um, art market of South Africa, both um, Hobbes and Rankin, and both in a more recent article, Nadine Ornstein has talked about prints in South Africa as not subservient to other mediums. And we all think about South Africa as this place where, oh my goodness, everyone loves prints. It's like the medium and not painting. I was wondering, as printmakers, would you agree? And also, to just I know you guys show it. Um, have oh, APS has a gallery, but you both sell online and have and participate in art fairs all over South Africa. I was wondering if you could speak to your experience of those. Who's buying? Um, is it really as popular prints in South Africa as we think it is, or not think it is, but like that? You know, is it the um, golden place of prints and? What do you observe following artists or mediums? What are other trends that are going on there? So with us um, and the fairs, uh, our, I mean, we have we have different um, price points. So we always want to cover everybody uh, in terms of affo affordability. So we have um, your William Kentridge and your student graduates work. So from like 50, thousand rands upwards um, and then from a thousand rand um, starting with with prints so we always want to make sure that everybody has the access to actually collect um, or start collecting prints um, because we've noticed that um, the online is still kind of climbing but I've noticed that people really want to explore and experience the actual thing live. So we have a lot of traffic at the art fairs um, and also with our pop-ups exhibitions and um, in-house exhibition. So the online is still, we still like trying to, you know, break the, the market there, but I've noticed that people still want to come and see the actual um, artworks. But yeah, in terms of price points, uh, we try to cover everybody. So like a student who just uh, graduated or or like um, who start, uh, a person who just started working, they can afford like a 1.5 um, graduate work. And then people who are, have been in the game of like collecting artworks, they can go um, higher. Uh, I, th I, think, I think print is a very democratic thing that, that, that people can collect at a very affordable price, especially if they're a new collector starting out, that they can, um, and, and we've, we find a lot of our collectors are, are private individuals who are building a collection or or buying their first work, and um, and they will buy a relatively new or unknown artist. Um, we we sell mostly through our online channel, but um, but I think that's to do with our isolated environment. In that, people can't just drop in very easily and pick up a print. So. So they 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 kind of are forced to do that, but the art fairs are are super important. I mean, we we don't do as many as we should, but 
but we when we do go to an art fair it's really it's really good to meet the collectors and talk to them and find out who they are and what they're looking for and um yeah i think i think both are really important as ways for us to to get our work out there so so what i would would add to to maybe the discussion a little bit you know in a way printmaking has taken off in the south african art market and i think when we started out we set set out to look at can printmaking provide a livelihood for young artists i mean so many young artists come into artist proof studio with with big dreams of making money they have no other form of income and i think we've had to really find a way to create the possibility of artists to make a living from their work and from their talent and i think i think the idea that an artist can come in with with almost not able to afford the transport in materials but but really find a way to believe in themselves and believe in their own agency and then be able to support themselves. I think one of the, the greatest prides of Artist Proof Studio is how many young, talented alumni who are making a living from their work and a very good living. And, and that is, is a really around building excellence. I mean, you, you mentioned at the beginning a, uh, a scholarship fund. Um, our, our, the chair of our board, um, Dr. Gianni Mariano had this saying, excellence through possibility. And I think he, we have a very strong board of directors because we were a public benefit organization. So we, we, we have been trying to work to be self-sustaining. And the only way to be self-sustaining is to make the income from not just grants and charitable foundations, but, but really look at ways that artists can help, you know, pay it forward, artists who do well, the money comes back in. And I think we've also been very blessed to have the, the partnership of, of an artist like William Kentridge, who, who really has, has been very supportive of the studio. And we do, do co-publish. And so when we co-publish, half the edition goes to Kentridge Studio and half the edition to Artist Proof, because he knows the income goes to support the education of young artists. So I think for in many ways, the market is very linked into livelihoods and how do you find outlets and avenues for students and artists to sell the work. So what Renee was saying is the different price points, how you come in, making it affordable, how do you market the work, how do you give artists the sense, you know, how to how to promote them themselves is is about finding voice in many ways. And I think in that way, yes, uh, it's much easier to make a living for an artist in our environment than, than say, in, in the States in that way, because there really is a real support uh, of artists to, you know, people will invest in young lives, will invest in youth. They have something interesting to say. And they are, you know, they do reflect society as where it is. So... So yes, it is a in that way, it's a very vibrant market for for printmaking. Great, thank you. That's very wonderful to hear. And then my last question before we open it up to the larger Q and A, being mindful of the good amount of time, three decades you spent in your corner of the print world, what are you excited about next? What are some next chapters, um, both for your presses and what do you think will happen in or in the future of South African printmaking? So I. I started the studio out of a love of printmaking and working in collaboration. And and I I don't have any plans to grow the studio or build an empire. Um I just I just enjoy doing it and want to keep on doing it. Um and, and that's and that's good for me moving ahead. Um and I just plan to keep printing as long as I'm strong and able to do it. And um and I'm comfortable knowing that when I get to the point where I can't, that I'm that I'm happy to close the shop down. So um yeah, I'm not I'm not looking to build a legacy or anything in in that way. Um and I think I think too that like the name of the studio, the artist's press, was was chosen 
because I wanted it to be about other artists, not about me. So, so for me, it's about the work and it's about the artists that I work with, and um, and I'm happy just to be just to be doing it. Um, we one of the things we did when we we started the studio is we we set aside two prints as workshop proofs that we wanted to give to some sort of a public collection or an institutional collection. Um, and and that that hasn't come to fruition yet. Um, the prints are, are getting um, put into archives, but um, I don't have a home for them to go to. So that that might be something that that I would like to look forward to trying to figure out is how to um, how to resolve that issue. Okay. And Tim? Shannon, do you want to Speak a little bit about the future plans of Artist Proof, and then I'll come in after you. Okay. I thought you would like to lead that, but I'm happy to. Um, we're looking for a permanent home. I think this has been a long time dream. Um, we we moved from Newtown to um, the Isle of Houghton, which has been a, in many ways a wonderful move. It has gardens and trees, and I think it's an interesting place to work, um, but it's not, it's a leased space. And um, the other managing director of marketing and sales and Kim have been working hard to uh, pull some of our archive work and raise funds towards uh, a building fund so that we can move permanently next year. So. What's important to us is um, to have a space that is ours and that will be here for another 50 to 100 years. So that's the dream. Um, it's very possible. I'd, I'd also like to add, you know, Kim may have mentioned this or not, but uh, we lost our chairperson of the board who's actually been with Artist Proof Studio as long as I have. And it was his dream to see this happen. So I think for us, that's um, it's quite a poignant time as well. Just yeah, just just to add, it it is a having our own space is is the dream. I think the thing about Arch Proof, we have a, a very wonderful team of young leaders. Um, I think both both Jani and and myself were very and our board of directors are very committed to mentoring young leaders to take over and I think there's a very strong strong team um, doing very innovative exciting things and I think that's part of the part of the vision is is around is around mentorship and growth and being self-sustaining. Again, like Mark said, we also put aside prints from every edition into an archive. So we have a historical legacy, but also an asset. So when for this building fund, we put, pull out our, our special treasures and put them on auction and, and, and raise some money. But I think for many of our artists, you know, we've also looked at very innovative ways to form a kind of endowment for education. So we've invited artists to come in and make prints. We ran some campaigns in over the time of COVID where we used the works of, of, of William Kendridge digital prints and each print was equivalent to a, a scholarship. So people would buy a, a print in exchange for a scholarship to support young artists. So I think our, our big dream still and our mission is really providing spaces for artists to follow their dreams and, and young people to, to get a good education and to really thrive as a printmaker. And I think um, in that way, Arts Proof, we want to see a long legacy. We want to, to keep going and we do want a, a stable home where we're not having to sort of keep moving. Um, so that's that is the is the big dream. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for all your time and sharing your spaces and your ideas. Um, that's the end of my question. So um, Cabell and I will attend to any questions in the Q and A that we have, or if anyone would like to pose. We have a note. Yes, that David Hockney also creates on his iPad. <laughs> She does when I spoke about Benelli. 
creating. Yeah, we still have a couple of minutes. So if any of the participants would like to um, ask any of our wonderful panelists anything that's on their mind, please put it in the Q&A. Um, in the meantime, Mark, I wonder if I might ask you a question about um, like the technique that your press specializes in. Um, I know you mostly focus on lithography and sometimes monoprint. Is that, um, do you envision experimenting with other styles in the future or are you um, focused or are you pushing artists to just focus on those two mediums for now? It, I mean, it's, it's not that we're, we're just pushing artists to focus on those two mediums, but um, we, I mean, I, I come from a commercial printing background and, um, and lithography has always been kind of the focus of what I've done. And, um, and I think, I think I'm, well versed in what lithography can offer and so so at one point we did have an etching press and we were experimenting with doing photogravure work using polymer plates and and we just found that that press kind of stood in the back of the studio and never got used and i think we just we just can do everything we think we want to be able to do with lithography and and so yeah it's it's diverse it's painterly it's um it, it it ticks all the boxes for us. So we we kind of just focusing on that just because it's 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 doing what we want it to do. Yeah. And that and that and that we, we also found that most of the artists who we work with are people who who can really draw or paint. And so the lithography lends itself to to people who 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 make marks in that way. Oh, that's great. Um oh we have some questions. Rebecca, would you like to? Um... Of course, we have two questions or comments, um, both from Judy Hecker and Edith Reed. Mark, they're very interested in your the, what you said earlier about analog thinking versus digital thinking, and what happens in the studio or the mind of the artists and the sources. Why is this now so different? I, I I think it's because digital is such a big part of our lives in every possible way, and um, I mean to 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 give you an example like. Previously, 20 years ago, when we were working on a print and we wanted to proof it, we would we would really need the artist to be in the studio all the time while we were proofing that they could they could advise and they could um, they could make subtle color changes and um, and and now I mean we started this during COVID, but um, working with with Norman Catherine, a South African artist, where where he he drew the plates and couriered them to me. And then we proofed one color and took a picture of it and sent it to Norman with WhatsApp and, and sort of kept this whole sort of WhatsApp conversation going as we proofed. And he could tweak it and change it and say, no, this is more the color I want. And he could show me something in his studio. And, and that, that whole digital thing has, has just, just changed the whole way that, that, that we think about, about making things. Um, and and yeah, I mean, even even an artist like Norman, who's who was really accomplished working with airbrush, he thinks completely digitally now. Um, he he uses digital mediums to play with colors and tries out different versions on his screen before he says to me, "Okay, this is the color that I want to use." Um, and um, yeah, it's 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 but it's a big shift to to still be making an analog product, but thinking in a digital way. Oh, um, no, that's great. Um, I'd like to um, turn to Michelle Ferrier's question. Um, and I think this is both for Mark and Kim and Shannon. In what ways do your studios work with public administrators or public art and public messaging? Are there collaborations and commercial uses? So I, th I think um, part of, yeah, part of our mission is as a public organization, we we have over the years run many campaigns that 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 tap into the HIV awareness campaigns, gender justice, issues around human rights. Um, so I think there's um many ways we we do it. In the in the early days we 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 took to mural painting and collaborating with public organizations um, or advocacy organizations. I think things like, um, you know, not so much a commercial public administration, but we also encourage uh, corporates to 
to um, provide contracts or commissions where we've done done murals or uh, big print installations. So we really look for ways of generating income for our young artists. So in many ways, it does mean going out into, into the public space, into looking at, at linking in with different, different kinds of issues. So we work, yeah, a lot, a lot with, with educational campaigns. We've, we're doing something at the constitutional court or if there's a human rights day or heritage day, we always involve the students to, to work, you know, actively in those ways. So I think we, we do look for, and, and I think it's part of looking for, um, you know, as I say, income, income opportunities for our, our members and students. Great. Thanks. And for our last question, we're going to take one from Nadine Ornstein, a curator who visited South Africa a few years ago, and she was really struck by how many of the museums were featuring prints in their exhibitions from their collections. And so she was wondering if you could speak to um, museums acquiring contemporary prints in South Africa. In terms, in, you know, are they very active in building their collections? Um, I know there's great institutional support. So how do you find that museums are collecting? I, I do know that a lot of museums in South Africa have had no acquisition budget for many, many years. Um, so, so I'm not sure. I think a lot of the prints that institutions may be exhibiting may be things that they have acquired many years ago. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I, I don't participate in the public space very much, so I don't actually know a lot about what museums are doing. Um, you know, we, we're, we're a small shop, it's, it's myself and, and two other full-time printers, and, um, and I have no other admin or support staff. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not sort of involved in, in, in that side of things. I think Kim might be able to have more input on that. Well, I, I agree that, that the museums don't have any, any budget, but, but corporates are, are, and are doing a lot for collection. In fact, the, the, where, where Shannon and Renee are tonight is the APSA Atelier. Um, they are very supportive of sponsoring young artists, growing young artists, um, but also exhibiting. So their corporate collection is extensive. And so they, they're they really buying many, the First National Bank, First Rand, First Rand Bank, um, RNB, um, are a big sponsor of ours. So they look at growing artists and they look at, at collecting artists in their corporate space. So we do have a very vibrant um, sort of market for, for corporate collections and, um, and, and, and very supportive of, of artists doing commissions. So, so for us, it's about, it's very much about how we manage to survive and how we manage to support the artists. So, so yes, but it's not it's not really governmental spaces. There, you know, there there was an art bank that opened up that was uh, nationally funded that started collections and placed in, you know, to place in museums. So there are some some um, of the art museums getting getting contemporary current work. Um, so there are different strategies, but mostly it's coming from corporate strategies. I, I, I don't know. Was there another part to Nadine's question? Sorry, that I that I missed. Or is that is I'm that okay? About museums acquiring contemporary prints. It's so yeah, the idea that it's existing maybe in another sphere now is a good answer. It answers our questions. And that we're at time. So I want to thank all of our panelists for their participation. Uh, I know Jenny is going to jump on. So thank you all for joining us. Just a quick thank you. Thank you so much, um, Shannon and Renee, Mark, Rebecca, and Kim for working with us across all the time zones to, to make this program possible. 
Um, and thank you to Cabell and our friends at APS uh, for your amazing series of programs. I hope you can join us tomorrow at noon Eastern. We have the second program uh, in partnership with the Drawing Foundation. Um, we'll go back to the 18th century tomorrow um, to explore aspects of prints uh, with Sebastian Leclerc and William and Jane Hogarth. Um, so we'll see you tomorrow at noon and see you at the end of the month at the IFPDA Print Fair. Thanks, everyone.